in retrospect, um, my four hardcore skills to resilience, um, which anyone can use for any kind of detour, um, which I'm going to go over now. But what's really cool about those is that I use them during the whole time of this detour, which I'll get into. Um, but then for this period of time where we're back in the same boat of this kind of unknown flux, I'm finding I'm using those skills again. So these are skills you can go back to over and over and over. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, and all this art right now, this is kind of to illustrate my journey, but that was another flower on my detour. I was always musical theater. I never picked up any kind of art thingy in my life. Um, so just another thing I was forced to discover um, because I wasn't allowed for a bit to go down the path I thought. So keep an eye out during this time when everyone's on there like baking bread marathons and what everyone's doing in quarantine. Um, so, oh, but the reason why I had that slide is, you know, growing up, um, you know, trees were my world. I was always like nature was a big, um, that was my sense of community. And that was um, where I found like connection and healing and inspiration. Um, and the good part about nature is it was there before and it was there after. So um, it was something I could, yeah, after my coma. So it was something I could keep going back to. And I think that's important when your life changes to find, okay, what are the foundational things that I still have? Even if it's just like my breath and like the sunlight, um, which uh, we still have. Um, this is um, when trauma hits. So one thing I want to mention now is that um, because I was studying musical theater so professionally, um, when I was 15, I started going into the city to take voice lessons with a really um, famous uh, voice teacher who really became my mentor. Um, and the reason why I brought up trees at the beginning was because he really understood my passion for trees and they really connected and um, he felt like a big mentor in my life. Um, and then two years later, when I was 17, he started sexually abusing me, which obviously was a complete shock to me. And if anyone is familiar with trauma um, and post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, there are three responses. You can fight, flee, or freeze. And I, I just froze. Um, and I kept going back there for lessons in this funk, just feeling like something was off, but I figured it was just me. I was really, you know, my teacher was telling me I like went to school in like just this like foggy zone. And later on when I created art, you know, words are often the hardest thing to express when we're dealing with something difficult. So this art that I discovered later was really a saving grace because I could, before I could put into words what had happened, this is how I saw that as um, my life had suddenly, you know, gone from like one color to the other and then just life became very blurry, um, which is that one. Um, and then, so I was sexually abused. I couldn't really figure out what was happening until I turned 18, uh, which was the beginning of April of my senior year. And I finally told my mom. Um, and then literally two weeks later, um, my stomach exploded. So there was not really time to process any of that. So basically when I woke up from a coma, there was a lot of different kind of healing to do, um, which was very over, uh, overwhelming and overlapping. And as you can see these, I think it was to my benefit that I had no formal art training because I could just instinctively, you know, patch together things to kind of sum up like this one, my world has split. Uh, you can see like, I'm on this side with like my school backpack and like I'm on the other side with my hospital gown and like there's a big kabam in the middle. Um, just trying to figure out what had happened. And then this is a lot of people asked what it was like in a coma. I had a lot of dreams of being underwater. So <laughs> that was the best I could figure out. Okay, now we get to the good part. 
the four secrets to resilience. Okay, these are my four secrets. They may seem like four really cheesy words you get on like Hallmark cards. Um, but the truth is, I, I feel like I'm living proof that these things work. And um, to, to credit that, these are really all I had to get through. Because obviously you think, okay, she comes out of a coma, she's discharged from the hospital. Let me add here, when I finally woke up, um, and came, became a bit more alert. Doctors told me what had happened. I had no stomach anymore. And, you know, when you're dealing with that, you know, and, and I see you're, and you're kind of foggy, you're still taking in all this information. But then they told me the big whammy that I couldn't eat or drink. You know, I'd been kind of too, like, you know, fog to even think about that. But they, but then I say, okay, like when? And they say, yeah, we don't know if or when that will ever happen again. So I guess they were waiting until I was alert enough to like absorb that information. I don't, I mean, that's a loose term for it. Um, but um, yeah, that was very hard. Um, but what happened was I was finally discharged from the hospital months later, uh, mostly because I had way too much energy that they couldn't really qualify me as like an ICU patient anymore because now my mother was in my bed watching like marathons of Everyone Loves Raymond. Um, and I was just like walking around the hallways and they were like, okay, Amy, it's time to go. But I thought, you know, when you're discharged from the hospital, like life goes back to normal, right? Um, no, I was sent home on IV nutrition and I was told like, go home and like stay positive, but you can't eat or drink anything. So it's one thing being in the hospital in like a little nest, but imagine like being in the world where even your kitchen, there's a sink, you can't have an ice cube, there's people like drinking water bottles and they look like Baywatch models as they're like just sipping a bottle of Poland spray and you're like, I want that. You know, it's like, how do you deal? And it's not only like they tell you like a year or like a week, they're literally saying like, we don't know when, we don't know if. So that was my period of uncertainty. I'm also the kind of person that doesn't like to just lie in bed and watch movies, even though I tried to get myself into it. So I needed to like do stuff and be in the world and I miss people. So what do you do when food is so much a part of the picture and you're starving? I mean, I was getting fed by, you know, IVs, but who doesn't think hunger is like psychological at all? I mean, I'm a Jewish girl. I love food. Um, so the end of that story is it turned into about seven years before I could eat or drink anything. At that time, I didn't know that. Um, and I think that was a benefit on my part because I could tell myself, okay, in a week, in two weeks, and those little baby steps got me through. And I think for any kind of detour, it's so cliche at this point to hear like, especially with all this like mindfulness stuff, you know, be in the moment, take it one step at a time. But I mean, some things become cliches for a reason. Um, so anyway, these are the skills I had to come up with myself as I went because um, my point was that, you know, you come out of a coma um, in the hospital with these circumstances, you still haven't even dealt with the sexual abuse before the coma. The first thing my parents did was take me to a therapist because, you know, you want to talk about these things. Um, and the therapist, the first thing he said to my parents was, you know, she can't eat, she can't drink, she's really hungry right now. It would be cruel of me to stick her in a room and make her talk about her feelings. I mean, she's hungry. So then I was like, okay, now I can't even do therapy. Um, but I guess the good thing is I had to figure out these skills on my own. Um, and I learned. Uh, through trial and error that these really work. So that's why um, I'm excited to uh, share them. Um, 
Another detour um, in my path was, it turned into 28 surgeries, but after number 13, uh, that was supposed to hook me up to eat. And um, it worked for a week. Um, I ate for a week and then um, my wound exploded um, because no surgery is a guarantee. And that turned into however many surgeries and years came after that. But again, that was a detour that I didn't expect. And looking for the flowers on the detour, um, that detour ended me up in Yale Hospital uh, for four months while doctors kind of shook their head trying to figure out what to do. They came up with no answers, but I got really angry and I got really pissed off, you know, because you've just been given like the, you can eat now, you're done with all this. And then it, you know, blows up in your face, literally. Um, and so I don't know if anyone's been to the lobby gift shop of hospitals when they're visiting a, a, someone in there or anything, but my mom going back on her old like retail therapy, um, she just kept going down to the gift shop and buying little cheap like art supplies, like, you know, kids craft sets and just leaving stuff in, in the hospital room. And I was just, you know, those times where you're just so angry that you just feel like, you know, folding your arms and being like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, leave me alone. I'm not doing anything. And I tried being like that for as long as I could. And then I remember one day um, I was so angry and I didn't know what to do with myself. And like, I felt like I was going to punch a wall. Um, but instead, it, you know, it was 4.30 in the morning, the time that the doctors usually come in and poke you around like you've been up and jolly all day, which I love. Um, but I just, before they came in, I went for one of those canvases and I never picked up a paintbrush in my life, but I just remember thinking like, I am so pissed off right now and I want to do something, you know, you want to control something and make this better, but I don't know what to do. So whatever I'm feeling, I'm just going to put into this paintbrush and I just like stab the paint and get the paintbrush and started painting what I was feeling. And I'll, I'll get to the first painting I made, but I had no idea that painting would be a way I could express myself, um, where I could be with whatever bad feelings I could, you know, I had, but they could be transformed on the canvas as I was painting. And I didn't need words. I didn't need to explain it. I could just do it and uh, be done with it. And these are some of the things I, and you'll see, like, all these started from like a place of real grief and upset. And like kind of my signature is I can't, I still can't leave a painting alone without like sneaking in a tear. Cause it's almost like if I don't, I didn't get to something. But in the end, they all become these like whimsical, joyful things because I find that however you do it, you can't get to the joy in your life once you like embrace like all the crappy feelings you're feeling. And especially for this detour that we're all going through, if you don't like accept that, oh, I feel lonely, I feel sad, I'm pissed off. You know, if you just try to say, I'm fine, I'm fine. All you're doing is stomping down that anger and it has to go somewhere. You know, that's where we usually find ways to cope through like, you know, maladaptive things that aren't so good for us. But Art was a really good way um, to uh, get out that miserable stuff that we're all allowed to feel so we can get to the good stuff. All right, so number one is hope. Um, so my biggest example of hope is as soon as I got discharged from the hospital, um, you know, and I didn't have a timeline for when I could eat, I started making fake timelines on my wall that said like seven days till I can eat again, six days, five days. And when it got to zero, I just started all over again. And I did that for years. And that may seem crazy, but it's also like an athlete has to, you know, envision the finish line. Um, I think hope is a lie that we actively have to create and tell ourselves. 
Um, it's not like this inspirational beam of light of, oh, I have hope and it just comes. You know, hope is something you do. Um, so I don't know if anyone can relate to that, but otherwise it's just kind of like a whimsical kind of, oh, wouldn't that be nice? And that, that doesn't do anything. I really feel hope can be a really powerful action move. Um, and I really feel like hope is a lie that you tell yourself. And if any of you guys read like, you know, fiction or science fiction or whatever, um, to get into that story, you know, it's willing suspension of disbelief. You know those things don't exist, or maybe they do, but let's just say you don't. Um, but you say, okay, to enter this world, I'm going to create these rules where there are dragons and sorcerers and things so I can fully engage in it. And uh, that's what I had to do. So that's quick. Uh, so create your own hope. Um, this may seem miserable, but you know, when you're hungry, you get obsessed with what you don't have. So I cooked the most amazing meals apparently for my family because at that at this point I had a really good sense of smell, <laughs> and because I just couldn't be away from it. Yeah, I had to be with it in some way. Um, so that was also a way for me to visualize, um, hopefully, what could be in my future. Okay, number two is creativity. So I got into that a little bit. Um, some of us consider ourselves artists. Uh, some of ourselves don't. Um, but I say that's crap. You know, we're all artists. We're all creative. Um, I really feel like creativity is a mindset um, because we all have energy in us. Um, so I define creativity as any way we can take that energy and turn it into something different. And that could be through laughing, that could be through cooking, uh, through doing a stupid dance, um, it's, it's through science, um, through putting things together. Um, it's any way, you know, it's a way to problem solve and it's a way to see things differently. Um, and um, I've used creativity in many forms. Um, art was this expression of creativity creativity that I had never thought of before, but it was a cool way that I could come with a beginner's mind. Um, I've been painting now. I call myself a professional artist now for 10 years. I still don't have any professional art training. Um, and I really am stubbornly keeping it that way because I need something where I'm not thinking, where I'm just creating from instinct. And you can do that with anything. It's really just a way to see everything just with a new awareness, as if you've never seen it before, um, and just um, approach things differently. Um, so it's, um, and it's a great way we can express ourselves um, and turn negative energy, because again, creativity is just turning energy into something different. It's how we can turn it into something positive. And this painting, so this is a painting that I made on that 4.30 a.m. morning of Yale Hospital, Singing Tree. And the funny part about this is when people see this now, people see like a happy singing tree. But I created it at like the worst time of my life. I won't use ultimatums because I've had some pretty bad times, but that was a pretty bad time. Um, and you'll see there are a lot of tears here. And it just started with this brown wavy line of like, I am so angry. And, but by staying with that feeling enough and finding a safe container, um, and that's what creativity is. It's our safe container to express whatever miserable stuff is going on. I, it allowed me to stay with that long enough where it could transform. And the cool part about, at least for art for me, is that you can paint it at such a negative time. And then it shows that, you know, this too shall pass. Like it passes and then at the end, uh, all you have is this thing of art that you can walk past and be like, oh, I kind of remember when I went through that. Um, and now, not self-promoting or anything, but that's the, um, that's the uh, uh, painting I put on the cover of my book. Cause for me, this really symbolizes um, how we can really transform what ha what happens to us um, through these um, things. So 
then the next skill oh and this is just a little bit about energy like i said creativity is energy and there are thinking forms of energy there are physical forms of energy so for anyone that says like they're not creative um think about what kind of energy you use during a day and think about how you change it and channel it through what you do um, and that's a really great healthy container to because the truth is during a detour you're going to feel crappy feelings and no one is saying you should just put a smile on and get through it um for all the people that just said you know keep a positive attitude i wanted to smack them and instead i just smacked my canvas around uh so everything you're feeling is energy you can't get rid of it so what do you do with it um these were my five best friends during that time because when you can't eat or drink you got to stay pretty isolated um, I call them my five superhero senses. And they're actually superheroes that come in with their big uh, superhero capes. Uh, the minute you drop in and decide what you feel with these five senses and say, I hereby grant you the power of now. And when you are present, um, you can really be in touch with um, whatever creative energy you feel right now and express it. So when I started feeling out of my body or like way too in my head, um, really just these, this was an easy way to ground myself. Um, I'm gonna dip through these because we don't have time to get all the stuff even though I have all these in worksheets that I can definitely send to you guys if you're interested. Um, and creativity leads to compassion because we all are creative in some way. Right, so number three is stories. Um, this was a very cool skill for me. Um, first of all, my mother is kind of this like ever eternal optimist to the point where I get kind of a headache. Uh, so as soon as I woke up from a coma, she started reading me all the inspirational comeback stories of you know memoirs of people who had been through trauma or had almost died. Um, and now we're like biking marathons and all that. And I just remember like thinking to myself, I just woke up from a coma. I can't even sit up straight. Like, why are you reading me this crap? You know, it, it just seems so far off. And, and I was right. Um, but later, as I started getting better and gaining strength, I started remembering those stories. And I, I thought about like, oh, maybe that can be me. So I learned from that, you know, I call it like building up your story inventory, you know, read, listen, talk to people, hear as many stories as you can, and they'll stay with you. Um, even if you don't relate to them right now, they'll come up when, when you really need it. Um, but how stories really help me is, I don't know if anyone knows, the archetypal hero's journey. Um, but um, I discovered this because um, when I couldn't eat, I had very little concentration and I would always walk through Barnes and Nobles. And I couldn't really read the books, but I could look at cool pictures. And there was this big, big bargain book, this mythology book. And the pictures were pretty cool. So I got it because it was like $5. And I remember looking through all the pictures and seeing that, oh wow, these stories are from like all over the world, from so many different time eras, but like they seem to have like one kind of thread where this person is like living his life. Um, something happens where they end up like in this dark world. Like I was looking at the Jonah story where he was suddenly in like the belly of the whale. Um, he has to fight all these demons and then he's like spit out. And then he finally comes home, but transformed like with a gift to give society. And I didn't realize I was looking right at the archetypal hero's journey. And then I discovered uh, Joseph Campbell who made this little handy dandy map. Um, and so this was perfect for me because I'm like, wow, okay, doctors are not giving me a timeline or anything. Or like a roadmap of like surgery one is this date, surgery two is this date. But hey, I can use these 12 steps and make my own calendar. 
So I actually used the hero's journey to like, you know, give me a roadmap for this unknown period of time. And I would write these like imaginary stories about it. Um, and really like just pretend I was a warrior on this journey. And that's how I dealt with this uncertain time period. And then I would read more stories and look for these steps. Um, you know, uh, Pixar has the a same kind of format. Uh, you know, Finding Nemo, Wizard of Oz. It, it's all it's all the same. So you know, we don't really have a timeline for any of this. Um, use this, and there are other uh, archetypal journeys too. But this is a good one. Um, eventually, creativity and stories. I was finally able to get back to doing what I love. Um, and in 2012, I premiered. I never talked about what had happened before to me. It was in some news documentaries, Channel 12 did something on it, but I had never spoken it from my own perspective. Um, and I just kind of took a big leap and said, I'm gonna just share it for like total strangers in New York. Um, but I got to come back on the stage and I got to do better than musical theater. I got to write my own thing and perform it. And I called it Gutless and Grateful. And where I really discovered detours was in order to write a musical about my life, you know, I couldn't just get up there, pull up a chair and start complaining about what happened to me. I had to take a theatrical arc, you know, and build it into a story. And when I was forced to do that, like, okay, what is the climax? What is the resolution? What is the message here? That's when I was like, oh wait, like all these things that happened in my life, because of that, I learned this about myself. I met this person, I got to do this cool thing. So how could I say like, I wish my life were any different? And that's really when I saw the flowers on my detour. And that's when I started calling it my beautiful detour, um, but not until that point. So that's why it's really important to, you know, keep a journal, or um, you know, write about some thoughts and just do a little free writing about what you're going through because you might not discover until you actually do some thinking and some writing or however you want to express it, like what you're, you know, what you're discovering. Uh, this is a Pixar story structure that they use for every, again, you can use a Finding Nemo as an example, but it's the same kind of archetypal hero's journey thing or, a detour idea that once upon a time there was, you know, I was sitting in my little classroom uh, and everything was normal. And every day I went to school and there was no social distancing until one day, ah, COVID. And because of that, ah, Zoom boxes. And because of that, ah, uh, masks. And because of that, ah, insert here until finally, then what all happened one day because of that? And since that day, and you can imagine, since we're not since that day yet, but you can create your own. And then uh, moral of the story is. Uh, so this is what Pixar uses for all their stuff. And hey, it, it makes them some big bucks. So uh, write your own COVID Pixar story structure and become a bajillionaire. Um, just kidding. Um, I'm running out of time. But um, I want to just briefly mention my grandparents were Holocaust survivors um, and uh, my grandmother survived Auschwitz when she was 18. So later on, because I eventually did go to college at 25 and because of my detour and what I learned, I realized I, you know, I was doing my musical theater thing. I was happy doing that. I didn't want to just go to school to study musical theater. I wanted to learn more and different Thing. So I went to Hampshire College, uh, best decision of my life, started at 25, um, ended up learning about psychology for the first time and playwriting and uh, oral histories um, and a bunch of other stuff. Hampshire's a great place. Uh, but I got to interview all these relatives I didn't even know I had and learn the story of my grandmother and grandfather coming here. And then I talk about my third TED talk, which I can give links to all those things after because I'm not gonna have time now. But these are some highlights. Um, 
again, these are all worksheets that I can give to you if you want, like, some help trying to, like, I lead workshops and stuff like that um, about finding your own detour, um, which I don't have time because I want to be conscious. Okay, this is important. Number four is gratitude. Um, we're in a season of gratitude, blah, but this skill is not just, okay, I'm thankful for everything that happened to me. Um, this I didn't discover till my 27th surgery because number 27 was after, a week after actually, I premiered Gutless and Grateful in 2012, ironically on election day. And um, this was supposed to like clear up all the last minute kinks I had. And you, you saw me in the picture there, I was singing and dancing about what happened to me, dancing of a storm, healthy, thinking I'm beyond all this. I'm gonna repeat again, no surgery is a guarantee. I turned into a total disaster. And I was stuck in Mount Sinai for four months. Again, doctors told me I couldn't eat or drink anything. They didn't know when or if. And I was pissed and I was tired. Um, and I, it was very surreal because literally the week before I'd been on stage laughing about this. And so I started making a list from A to Z, mostly because I was hungry and I wanted to keep my fingers busy. It was not because I was trying to be grateful, but I needed something to keep my mind off of food, especially because we were there for all the holidays, which was another story. Don't go to the hospital on the holidays. There's no one there. It's no fun um, if you can avoid it. But um, I started just making myself write something I was grateful for every day for every letter of the alphabet. And what I noticed was that these gratitude things, even if they were real big stretches, like W was window, even though the same window was there, they were coming from a larger place. They were coming from what my values were, like a window, because I can see nature. Oh, right, nature is important to me. Um, F, family, um, family is important to me. And I realized that your values stay with you no matter what. And that was a really good reminder for me that I was bigger than what had happened to me medically. And even if your detour changes you, um, your values will stay the same and they'll always kind of nudge you in the right direction of where to go on your detour. So that was a really important thing for me. Um, I don't need to read you about the power of gratitude. You all know that. Um, and then I ended up, and, you know, I discovered a few more beautiful detours from that Mount Sinai fiasco. Um, I realized that I wanted to do my show again, but I wanted it to be for something larger than musical theater. I knew there was a message there. And long story short, that was in 2012. And for eight years, I've been touring across the country to colleges and schools and organizations um, with the show, doing like a mental health and PTSD and sometimes sexual assault prevention talk back after. Um, and that was really a way for me to really, it made my story feel relatable and to have people come up to me and, and really um, ask questions and share their own detours. I realized, wow, like we all feel better when we start like coming together because of detours and talking about them. So another emphasis that like, use this as an opportunity. We're all going through something vaguely similar. Um, and so I started this thing called being a detourist and that's in my first TED talk, which I can give a link to, but I started just saying like, oh, if you've had any kind of detour in your life, just do a hashtag because those are very in. Um, love my detour. And I got people from all over the world which was very cool. And then on my blog, I had a weekly series where anyone would write about like any detour in their life, whether it was like a tiny, tiny thing or a huge thing to them or whatever. Um, and then how it changed them. And it was really uh, inspiring to a lot of people. And I'm still doing that. So if anyone wants to write me something uh, or share a detour, uh, you never know who you could, um, who you could get to. And now um, my fun stuff, my book is out. My audio book is coming out in a month. Um, but I do wanna end really quickly with um, 
sharing a little video um, I made on um, detours for you to watch. My name is Amy Ostriker, and I love and of my detour. What's a detour? A detour is a curve in the road, a, a bump in the path, a big sign in the middle of our trip that says, sorry, you have to go that way. Believe me, I didn't expect to end up in a coma the April of my senior year of high school. An unexpected blood clot my senior year. That was my detour. The road that followed, even with the 27 surgeries thrown in, became my beautiful detour. Without those twists and turns, setbacks and obstacles, I never would have learned so much about life, the people in my life, and what I'm capable of. If you can appreciate the little twist in your path, that makes you a detourist. A detourist looks for the upside of obstacles. They follow that twisted path because they're curious to see where it may lead. So, are you a detourist? Why wouldn't you be? That's why I want to hear from you. Share your crazy journeys, your detours, the things in life that happen that you didn't expect, whether it's a breakup, a breakdown, a broken nail. Write me and tell me what happened. Draw a picture of your detour. Take a photo, sing a song, do a dance, but whatever you do, use the hashtag love my detour that way we can all track each other's journeys think of it as a traveler scrapbook so consider this a field trip detours and start sharing your travels together we're not alone i love my detour now tell me why you love yours all right now i've gone way over the time so i'm gonna stop now but um i'm gonna put a ton of links in the chat hey stop music hello I don't know, because um, I think my four TED Talks will give you more stuff about that, but I want to stop for uh, questiones. Oh, where are you? Yeah, let me get the chat. Any questions, or Lisa, do you want to take over? Um, what, let's see, do you want to, do, do you want to keep the share screen up? I can open it up so that everybody can see each other again. Yeah, let me stop the share because I'm going to also put some links in the chat, Perfect. which I highly recommend. Perfect. Okay, so everybody is up here. And now the floor is open to ask Amy whatever you want. Oh, and Lisa, were you recording this? I was. I started it late because all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I have to record. So. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, and thank you. So I'm opening it up to the floor now. And don't be shy. Um, okay, I have a question. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for talking to us. Uh, everything you said is really inspiring, just how optimistic you stayed like throughout everything. Um, so I was wondering, at like your toughest times, what like specifically helped you get through it, like in addition to your painting? Yeah, um, so definitely, uh, I mean, honestly, like being able to walk outside because again, nature, you can see there's trees and all my paintings, all that stuff. Um, but it was just time for me to figure out what was going on for me um, and just connecting with, I mean, nature, which is why I've now I'm in grad school uh, studying um, environmental justice and working on performance on that. But, um, you know, nature has always been here. It has this wonderful way of like transitioning and shifting with whatever it throws it. So it was my constant like learning resource. It was also a way I could just get away from all the machinery and, and stuff like that. Um, but um, yeah, I think when I didn't know what to do, I'm also someone that just, I literally cannot stay still. And I was not someone that was just going to curl up in bed and sleep. So that's the easiest answer. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, right, no problem. Oh, I, oh. Hey. 
Oh, I had a question. So I also, I wanted to thank you. I thought your story is really inspiring and everything. And I just was wondering like with art and how you um, like took up the hobby a lot while you were um, like sick. Did you, um, like was art kind of a way to help you keep going or did you like, like was it a, a, a motivation for you to keep going or was it more of like a hobby that just helped you pass the time? Like was it something you felt passionate about or was it more just something to pass the time? I mean, well, I wouldn't say it's either or. I always say I'm run by creative fuel. Like I would not be here if it were not for creativity to keep me going. Um, it was how I felt like I could make a mark somehow because, you know, without food and drink in your life, you're, con- you're kind of like shut out from everything. Um, and I, again, I'll say over and over again that, you know, um, especially as a survivor of sexual abuse and people are talking about barriers to reporting and things like that, um, or when trauma freezes us, you know what? We can't just come out and talk about it because words are like the very last thing that come with anything, with any kind of mental health issue or, you know, whatever. Um, we're really just energetic things and they have to come out in however they have to come out. And so art was a cool way I could just throw around whatever I was feeling. So it, it did feel like something I had to do when I wanted to get something off my chest. and. Um, yeah, so it was just part of moving forward, I think. Otherwise, I would just be uh, finding ways to ignore like the bad stuff in my life, I guess. You know, we all need some kind of way to like acknowledge like, oh yeah, I am feeling angry. I am feeling crappy and hey, that's okay. Um, and art was my way to like be with it um, so it could turn into something else. Hope that's an answer to your question, Father. And there was a hobby too, because it's fun. I think somebody else had a question, but I didn't see who it was before Paige as well. Oh, that was me. Um, I was just gonna say that I think you know my mom, uh, Tara Cook Littman, and Hi, my Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi, Tara. And, um, I remember one time when I came to your house and you cooked dinner for us and baked and I just remember it being really good and I also remember seeing all of your paintings and I thought it was really cool and I was like eight years old then. Oh wow see look I have a testament to good cooking good I don't remember whether that time I could eat or drink or not but um hey it's good to hear. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> And yes, I can eat now, everyone. I always forget to mention that. And my favorite food is cheese, if you're also curious. Uh, I love that. It's true. You can eat it for me, Amy. <laughs> Anyone else? I'll share what else I can share. Let's see. Um, I can say for me that um, I took so many notes, like I wrote all this stuff, um, be, you know, and I'm going to use a lot of what you said to talk to my 13 year old who's going through some stuff. So I, you're, I love the detours, like all, it's just, that's amazing. And again, I have all these workshops available, but I just put a bunch of links in the thing, but if you go to the the TEDx talks, all four are on there. Uh, the first one's about being a detourist. The second one really goes into like the four skills to resilience. Uh, the third one is about ca how capturing the story of my grandmother really helped me persevere. And the fourth one I just gave last week about how creativity can fight climate change because hey, it's important. That's great. All right, who else has some questions here? I'm going to copy the links, everyone, as well, so I can send it off to everyone. And hey, if you want a little more shameless promotion, but um, <laughs> if you're interested in having me come and lead a workshop at your school virtually, um, I'm doing all that since uh, 
the beauty of this detour is, hey, I just like live streamed my show for this great theater in San Diego, which I wouldn't want to do and fly there right now. Um, so, hey, <laughs> but, but besides that, you know, think about the things that you were able to discover to discover just because of this. Um, and I hope that helps. And, you know, if anyone wants worksheets on the four skills to resilience or navigating a detour, then, um, yeah, let me know. Amy, can you also plug in the, um, I loved the Pixar, um, the story there. Yeah, that's a, a worksheet. I can okay. send you guys. Yeah, I can email you that. That would be great. Thank you. Um, anything that spoke to anyone, anything that kind of jumped out on you for maybe part of the resilience um, with her for the gratitude, the creativity, the hope, and the stories? Anything in particular? Story spoke to me, so I was curious about anybody else. Definitely. I think we have more energy than they do, Amy. <laughs> that's usually a question I get. Where do I get all my energy from? I, that's a good question. I still don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I, actually, I have something that I think stood out. Um, when you were talking about how hope is like something like it's not really like this like magical thing. It's like a way of just like getting yourself to keep going. And I just thought that that part was really interesting because sometimes it's like, you think that there's no point in hoping because you, like there's no chance of something happening, but the way that you said it made it seem like there was more of a point to having hope. Yeah, well, I think the thing with hope is like people have all of these like different definitions and I really hate the people that are just like, oh, have hope. It's like, okay, what does that mean? You know, hope has to be an action. Otherwise, you know, I just call it like, inspirational get well cards you know like hope is something you do um and that's with anything you, you got to do something um otherwise it's just there so think about what you can do it can be a little thing um but it is something you got to do yeah i mean i found it awesome how you really found little things that kind of kept you happy or kept you going and i thought that was great it was truly inspiring your story thank you to add on, I was also going to say, I thought it was interesting how you uh, made these routines, like how you said you would count down the days till you could eat again, and you found these hobbies, and yeah, like everyone said, very inspiring. Thank you. Well, I'm not advocating this for, you know, everyone, but I think it was, in a way, it was a benefit that I didn't get slammed right into therapy where I was forced to just like talk about it. Cause I really had to figure out like, okay, what works for me? And like this whole thing was working, this countdown seems to work. So I guess they just stayed with me as skills. Not only I use them, but you know, I can use them for any kind of detour for, you know? Um, so, and I think if I had just gone right into knowing what mental illness was or PTSD or things like that, you know, that's how we get victimizing. Oh, I'm depressed or, oh, I have this. You know, this was just a very kind of um, childlike, open-minded way to look at it. And I think that's what gave me new avenues. So even if you do feel like you're struggling with something, you know, which is completely valid, still challenge yourself to be like, okay, like, but how can I use this as an opportunity um, and explore what I can uh, do with, with whatever is going on inside? So keep pushing yourself to explore because you're, you don't know what you're capable of until you're forced to. And I always say you don't always need to be forced to, but hey, now we're all forced to. So dig right in. Do it. I know. My God, we are all forced Let's to. Do it. <laughs> Amy, you have been an absolute treasure. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to hear you speak so, felt like a million years ago. You were I know, right? I know, my gosh. I was like 12. I don't know how old you were at the time. <laughs> to everyone here, I'm leaving my email address too. If anyone wants to send me um, an email or I don't know if you want to like my Facebook page or whatever, you know, send me an email. Tell me uh, 
what's going on. If you have any other questions, you know, I'm more than happy to do that. So. Awesome. I'm going to send everybody all this stuff. I'm going to make sure that I um, have it all and I know how to find Amy and get any information that you guys need. Amy is super accessible. Um, please don't feel like you can't reach out to her for anything. Um, she really is the genuine deal. And I, from the bottom of my heart, Amy, thank you so much for being a part of our amazing journey. Um, and sharing your amazing journey um, with us. Does anyone do any fun like closing Zoom rituals? Like, let's all touch boxes. Maybe if I'm taking a mime course right now. I don't know. No, no. All right, we tired of Zoom. Okay, we're tired of Zoom. <laughs> no, I get it. I, get it. I, I think that's a great idea, though. Um, we'll have to think about that one. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, anyway, email me, you guys, if you have any questions, comments, or you're like, I hate you. I want to send you that. <laughs> um, last chance for a question. Otherwise, we'll close out for the rest of the night. Um, okay. Amy. Fred. No, I'm Thank off. You. I love it. Thank you. And everyone, I'm going to, I'll send you guys stuff uh, tomorrow so that you have everything and please have a great night. Everybody enjoy your day off from Merkaz um, next Tuesday and I'll see you on the 10th. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks guys. Amy, you are a bright, um, well, a bright person. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Hey, reach out if any of you are, you know, any of your staff, right? You know, like I love this stuff. So you're sorry I went a little over, but. Um, it's perfectly fine. Um, I, I've taken so much from you that I really am going to, uh, you know, so I, I'm taking a lot of what you've been doing and I love your artwork and all of that because. Um, my husband passed away and so my son who's now 13 is really struggling um okay. thank you so i there's so much that you're doing that i think would really speak with him the way that he does express everything is through dance he's a classically trained ballet dancer oh my god oh yeah so, so that's that, what you keep it yeah I, oh i love to connect with him <laughs> So that's like my, that's his outlet. But I think a lot of what you say is sounding better than all the stuff that I keep like on him. So, um, well, nothing sounds good for me, mother, you know, never. Yeah. never. So I thank you personally. I am useless. <laughs> I am totally useless. Just kidding. <laughs> no, it's very true. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I personally am going to take this to go with my son. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, thanks for having me again. Thank you. And Thanks. I'm, all right, I'm going to let you have a good rest of your night and I'm going to copy all your stuff down so I can send it to my students. Perfect. Thank, all right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.
Why won't this stop? Oh my God, what is the problem? 